Good to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today's a family Sunday. We normally have children's church, but today they're in here because today's a baptism service. So we will get started and uh, I'm going to share some of my heart with you, a testimony. We'll get into the word. Then we'll have our baptism service. I know the kids are in here. Kids, I promise you, you can't sit up straight. You can pay attention. You know when you go to the movie theater and it says no cell phones or, or essentially they'll kick you out? Um, we all walk past that in a movie theater to see a movie and nobody's offended. We say that in God's house and people are offended. Well, I'm sorry if you're offended, but I'll, I want to say this. There's something I care more about than offending you. I care so much more about offending God. This is the house of God. So unless, uh, unless you are an EMS or fire worker, please do not be on your cell phone. Please do not let your kids watch YouTube during the service. Uh, uh, please keep those off. I never want to hinder when we gather and assemble on this first day of the week and worship a risen Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. What's well, good to be in God's house? I love the Lord this morning. I'm going to be in a little bit. You better turn there now because I'm going to jump right to it when it's time. I'm going to be in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 1. And in fact, and then right before then, that's going to, where I'm going to preach from. I'm also going to be in 1 Corinthians 10. I'll probably be there first quickly and then hit Numbers 13, verse 1, and um, let's just go ahead and pray, and we'll get started. Father, have your way in Jesus' name. I pray for your anointing, for your directions, for your leading. God, I need you now. I'm a nobody that you've saved and called, and, and uh, I, I need you, God. Please anoint my lips. Please anoint my tongue. I present myself to you in weakness, God. Please carry me and hold me. Please manifest uh, yourself. Please Fill this place with your spirit. Please carry me and hold me. Please give me your directions. Please show me what to say, what not to say, and how to say it. Please give me a pure heart to do what I do, to preach your word clearly, boldly, unashamedly, as out to in spirit and truth, in truth and in love, in fear of you and nothing and no one else, looking to please you and honor you and no one else. Please change eternity today. Please save souls. I don't know how many services are left on this side of eternity. I do know this, though. Today matters. And in the realm of eternity, in the realm of eternity, today absolutely matters. I'm asking you, Father, to do what only you can do. I'm asking you to save souls, change lives, disciple, teach, preach. Please just give us of yourself. Break chains, heal, revive, restore, unite. Please bind any hindrance, any distraction that would come against me or your people. Please have your way. We need you. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, my name is Branson Sears. I'm 41 years old. I'm the head pastor here at Faith Ignited. I moved here two and a half years ago with my family. I was born and raised I'm from Derby, Kansas. I lived in Derby my whole life. I graduated from Derby. My parents graduated from Derby. And I'm just a lifelong Derby guy. And uh, when I was growing up, I went to church all the time. Church was my life on Mount Vernon and Hillside, Messiah Baptist Church. Messiah Baptist Church was at Mount Vernon and Hillside. I can remember the first 10 years of my life being there all the time. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I remember my dad was the youth director at that time. I think that church was four or 500 at that time. And uh, that was the first 10 years going to that was my life. I went to Derby Christian. I went to Sunrise Christian Academy. Um, that was just going to church was my life and my world. Uh, if you don't know now, uh, if you've heard of New Spring Church in Wichita and K94, uh, K96 and 21st Street in Wichita, that is Messiah Baptist Church. Mark Hoover was my, uh, was my pastor when I was a little boy. Uh, that same church, so New Spring is the church I was raised in. It just had a different name then. It was at a different location. But that was my life. That was my world. Um, I got, um, uh, when I was 10, um, something happened with my father and my parents got divorced and he went to prison and my mom remarried and we started going to a different church in Derby when I was 11. When I was 11 years old, we started going to a different church in Derby. And from then until I moved out when I was 17, we went to this church in Derby. And I'm just going to tell you guys something about my experience there. 
When I moved out when I was 17, I believed in the Bible. I believed in Jesus, been taught it my whole life. I believed in the scriptures. I believed in the word. I knew all 66 books of the Bible. Thank God for teachers teaching children's church. Amen. Amen. I knew all the scriptures and things were taught to me at a young age. So when I moved out, I believed I was saved. I was believed I was born again. I believed I was going to die and go to heaven, even though... Uh, I would continually walk in darkness. That's one of the things that terrifies me is how many people think that they're going to die and go to heaven and they're going to burn in eternity in hell. That scares me because I believe that and lived that for years. Many shall say on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I do this and that? And he will tell them plainly, plainly depart from me. I never knew you. You workers, you practicers, you, you workers of lawlessness. That means sin, those who walk in darkness. When I moved out when I was 17, I hated church. I hated church people. I wanted nothing to do with church. Um, just my experience at that church that I went to in Derby was, the only thing I can describe it to you um, uh, from the Bible. Hey, ma'am, one of the things we didn't tell you, if you walk out, there's actually a bridal room around here for in infants and babies. You can hear, and it will have uh, scriptures on the screen, and you can hear the service. If you go out those doors, our security guy, he'll show it to you. It's a brand new bridal room. Yeah, sorry, I should announce that earlier. Anyways, when I moved out when I was 17, I hated church, and I hated church people, big time. Uh, the only thing I can describe it to you from the scriptures was Pharisees. You need to know this. Everybody in this room, pay attention. Because God has told us this. God has warned us of this. This is in the scriptures and it's in the word over and over and over and over again. You need to know it because some people, many people think, I want nothing to do with church and organized religion. I've got my own thing with God. Listen to me. No, you don't. Boy, it got quiet there. That's all right. You don't. How do I know that? Because I've read the Word. Because I know what it says. I know what it teaches. Nobody in Scripture ever, nobody, zip, zero, zilch, nobody following God did their own thing and rejected His bride, the church, the organization that He gave His life for. If you're not saved and part of the church, if you're not going to a local assembly, that means you are walking in darkness, not doing what Jesus did, and not following the teachings, not following Him as Christ. Boy, it's getting real quiet in here. That's all right. You don't hear this stuff preached anymore, do you? See, we've gotten away from the Word. The number one tool in the hand of Satan is a bunch of religious fakes. It was true 2,000 years ago, and it's true right now. Brady, I got some, I got some eyebrows raising up in here. You know what, Brady? We're so used to, we're so used to soft preaching. <laughs> we don't even know what that word means anymore. It's a herald. Oh, and by the way, they didn't have what we have. Charles Spurgeon, you think I preached long. Charles Spurgeon would preach for three to four hours at Metropolitan Baptist Church. He would preach to 10,000 people with no speakers and would use, use his voice. This is a problem. We don't know the word anymore. And even people like me, our whole life, have heard it. We've heard it a million times over, and it still hasn't registered. That's why I'm mad after I got saved and I saw people raise hands and shout in church. I'm like, what are these weird Pentecostal people doing? <laughs> By the way, we're not Pentecostal. We're not. We're not charismatic. We're not Baptist. None of those denominations exist in Scripture at all. It's incredible how simple the Bible is if you read it. Those who followed Christ were called Christians. Zion's giving me an amen. That's what I'm talking about, Zion. Zion, you've got to help me out now, buddy. You're the only one. So when I moved out, I believed I was saved. I believed in all these things, but I hated church and I hated church people. The devil used a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites and fakes to have Jesus crucified. The devil entered into Judas's body and then made a deal with a bunch of religious fakes. It was true 2,000 years ago. It's true today. Someday you won't be able to stand before God and say, I rejected you, didn't serve you because of those fakes. You won't be able to do that, I'm sorry because God's warned us about it over and over and over and over and over again. 
So that's, when I moved out when I was 17, you know, I started off just, just kind of smoking pot, getting drunk. By the way, everybody look this way. Smoking pot is sin. Getting drunk is sin, and it's wrong. Getting high is sin. You will not insult my intelligence. You could just take it somewhere else and come and tell me about the medicinal uses and stuff. I've heard it. I don't want to hear that. It's stupid. It's foolish. Go insult somebody else. Getting high is drugs. It's sin. It's sorcery. Drugs are sin and sorcery. Well, getting high, smoking pot's not a gateway drug. Yeah, okay, go take that somewhere else. Because guess what? When I started off smoking pot, when I started off getting drunk, I didn't plan on later doing acid and ecstasy and, 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 and pharmaceutical drugs and, and ecstasy and cocaine and meth and all those things that I did for years and years and years. You're saying, Branson, you did that? Yes, I did that a lot. I've done a lot of drugs, hard drugs, and I'm ashamed of it and I don't want to talk about it. It makes me sick to my stomach. I hated myself, I hated my life. I was a fighter, thought I was tough, thought I was hard. I wasn't, I was scared and hurt and broken. Young men, listen to me. It takes a real man to not act like a three-year-old child and lose your temper. It takes a real man, sir, pay attention. It takes a real man to not get drunk. It takes a real man to submit to the Lord, die into self and lead your wife, your family, your kids in your home. And I want to say this to you. If you're doing those things, my heart goes out to you. People say, well, I don't understand why people do drugs and alcohol. Well, I do. It made me feel better. Why do you think people do it? To feel better because they don't feel good. It's an escape from reality. My heart goes out to people that do those things. And I can tell you this. One of the things we're going to hear today, it's not a matter of trying. I tried for years. I wanted change, but I couldn't. It's not about trying harder. It's about dying. The old Branson died. How'd that happen? Well, my name's Branson. I already told you that. Now, my whole life, people have told me, Bra uh, Braylon, people have told me, I wanted to name you Branson, okay? I never named another Branson, met another Branson. But Hannah didn't want to call you Junior. So I was watching a football game years ago and Braylon Edwards was playing it. I was like, Branson, Braylon, that's close. That's how you got your name. Anyways. <laughs> so I, I'm in the gym. I'm in a gym one day in Derby. And back then I was doing all the drugs and shooting steroids and all that stuff, getting arrested and being a wild man. Well, I met a guy in the gym one day. Now, people have always joked about my name. That, you know, like I'm Springfield or I'm Dallas, that kind of stuff. Well, I met a guy in the gym and he needed a spot and my name's Branson. He told me his first name is Joplin. I was like, huh? Hmm. <laughs> his first name is Joplin. And guess what? He was the pastor of a church. It was a brand new church. And guess who's, remember I told you I went to a real legalistic church in Derby that I hated? They built up north and they sold their property. And guess who they sold it to? Joplin. So he told me two things. He invited me to church. And told me where the church was. I knew where the church was. And he told me his name. And I remembered his name. And he invited me to church. And when he invited me to church, you remember this, Eli, when you're witnessing at work. You guys remember this when you're serving the Lord. When he witnessed to me and invited me to church, I was like on the inside like, <laughs> save it, preacher. Got it. You remember that. Because an invite of somebody that didn't receive it months later showed up and it changed my life. So he invited me to church. I didn't think anything of it. Months later, me and Hannah at that time were servers at, at, at a rib crib. And, and October 21st, 2007, Hannah, I remember I was on probation, didn't have a license. Hannah was going to come pick me up and take me over to her church in Hayesville. And um, boy, us derby folks don't like Hayesville. Just like they say Winfield, don't like Ark City, and Ark City don't like Winfield. You know one of the good things about being and not being from around here? I don't care about that stuff. If you're from Ark City, God bless you. We're glad you're here. This church is for all of Cowley County. Anybody wants to come? I don't care about that stuff. Unless you're from Hayesville now. I'm just joking. My wife's from Hayesville. 
So me and my, my girlfriend at the time, October 21st, 2007, my alarm goes off because she's going to come pick me up and take me to church in Hayesville. October 21st, 2007, at 569 South Derby Avenue in Derby Street. My alarm goes off. I'm 25, almost 26. And October 21st, 2007, my alarm goes off. I lean forward. I wake up. I can still see it. I lean forward. I wake up at Grandma's house. I wake up. Something speaks very clearly inside of me, very clear. Joplin. I'm like, that's weird. Why would I think of this guy that I met months before in the gym? That's strange. Got up, got dressed. Hannah comes and picks me up. We drive over to Hayesville. We walk in the front doors. I'd been slaughtered drunk the night before. Can't remember what I've been done, but I walked in, I had a Gatorade. Now, I know how church people are supposed to greet people, okay? And I know half of you are weirded out when I greet you when you come in, because I'm so excited. I'm sorry. I walked in, I had a Gatorade, I had a cap off. The first thing guy says to me, hey bro, we don't bring drinks in here. You know, as people, we pair feelings. You know, all those old feelings came back and I said, man, this is why I hate church people. Hannah had something else going on with her family, very long story short, before service started. We ended up leaving and driving back to Derby. She was crying in the car. And I remember thinking, man, what a strange day. I'm dressed. We're going to church. Didn't plan on any of this happening. Hey, Matt, would you come here very quickly? Quicker. <laughs> All right, anyways, what was I saying again? Good. That's right. So we're in my car. We're driving back to Derby. Didn't think too much of it. My wife is crying, and I remember driving back. We never went to church, and I was thinking, this is why I hate church and church people. This is why I don't want to go. We're driving back, and I remembered, isn't that strange that I thought about that Joplin guy this morning? So we start driving back. Uh, we're driving back. We pull up, and I, I told Hannah, hey, we can make this guy service. We go back inside. We go back into the parking lot. We go back inside. We go back in, and... and uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Not, not received? Okay. So we're driving back to Derby. I pull up. We pull up to Joplin's church, and I go to pull the door open. And as I go to pull the door open, all those old feelings came back. You know, the enemy loves to pair feelings. That's his plan. I remember thinking, this is just a building. It's a new church. A church is a people. It's a body. We walk in. We sit down in the back over on this corner. At that time, the church was only like 80 or 100 people. We go in and we sit down in the back. And when I sit down, something speaks to me as clear as daylight and says this. God brought you here today for a reason. Now, we had walked in a little bit late, and the pastor was about to walk up there and preach. God spoke that to me. Joplin walks up on stage. I'm in the back. I don't think anybody saw me, really. We had come in during late, during songs. Joplin walks up, and this is what he says. I'm supposed to finish my sermon series today on Nehemiah. But God told me to change the sermon last night. He said, one in five times has God ever told me, like he did last night, to change the sermon. That got my attention sitting there in that pew. I remember thinking how strange it was that I ended up here, and then how strange it was that he walked up and just said that. And how strange it was that something had told me his name that morning, and how strange it was that I'd sat in this pew and God said, 
I'm going to speak to you here. I brought you here today for a reason. He gets to preaching. And as he's preaching, the sermon was called Soldiers for the Cross. And as he's preaching, I begin to feel like there's a ghost actually in the room. I'm just trying to describe to you how I felt in that moment. I felt like there was a ghost in the room and it actually knew me. And what the pastor was preaching, it was like he was only talking to me and nobody else in there. And while he would preach, it felt like it was only to me. And while he would preach, these walls came up inside of me. These walls would come up inside of me. And uh, basically, I would say this, Brady, God, where were you then? What about this? What about that? What about all these church people? What about all this? And Joplin, whatever I would say in my heart, he would respond and preach. And, and it was like, Brady, these concrete walls were going up. And it was like what he would preach. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the word is like a rock that breaks the stones. I was preaching, and as I would preach, uh, excuse me, he was preaching, and as he would preach, those walls kept coming up. And as those walls kept coming up, he would preach in the Word. Everybody look right here. Look at me. I'm the preacher. I'm up here. The Word would go forth and smash it like a rock. And those rocks inside of my heart, pretty soon there was no walls left, no rocks left. No more Mr. Tough Guy, Brady. No more fighter. No more drugs and alcohol. It was just Branson. Amen. You know what I realized in that moment, Brady? You're not tough. You're not hard. You're hurt. You're broken. You're lost. And you've always known the truth. And you've gone your own path and done whatever you wanted to. They gave the altar call. I didn't know anybody in that place. I know altar calls are basically gone from churches anymore, but I don't care. We're going to have them. The Old Testament, when you walked in, the altar was the first thing that everybody saw, and you publicly gave your sacrifice on the altar in front of everybody. Thank God Jesus fulfilled that. Thank God the blood of bulls and goats could never save us. It was a picture pointing forward to what Jesus, our Savior, would do at the cross. And he has saved and now uh, he, he has uh, risen and born again. And now this picture is us, a place for us to be able to respond to him. If you look when Jesus was moving people's lives, they always responded immediately. We'll always have altar calls. We'll always have a place to respond to God. I didn't know anybody in there. I walked forward and I, I remember I was sitting there at the altar and, uh, excuse me, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'm standing there in my pew. I didn't know anybody in that place. And I remember telling God, I don't have anything left. I stepped out of my pew, walked down to the altar. I hunched over and cried and prayed. I wept like somebody died. And I remember I said inside of my heart, God, I don't have anything left, but what I have left is yours. I always thought it'd be a ball and chain to serve God. I remember when I stood up, that is a lie to keep you in your darkness and your sin. I remember I stood up and the ball and chain was gone and I was healed, saved, and delivered. Amen. Born of spirit. Born of spirit, born again. My girlfriend, who was Hannah at that time, I looked over and I thought she left. She was over at the altar too and God changed her life that day. We left that day changed and saved, born of spirit. We left that day, everybody thought we were crazy because we got married two months later. Everybody thought either she, that she was pregnant or thought we were crazy. Both were not true. We were saved and born of spirit, born again. You know, I told Joplin everything I told you guys just now, and he said, I looked out when I saw you. He said, when I saw you and God told me to change the sermon, he said, God revealed to me and spoke to me and said, that's why I had you change the message. 
Everybody listen to the sound of my voice. God will send his spirit, heaven's hound. There was a ghost in that room that did know me. God will send his spirit, heaven's hound, just to find you. And whenever we assemble at a place like this, I'll tell you what, honey, my weaknesses are on full display. I have no notes this morning. I have no degrees. I have no seminary. I have nothing. I'm an evil, wicked scallywag that God saved and pulled from the darkness 15 years ago. We dove right in. People ask, how'd you change? I was saved and born again. Wasn't no 12-step program. One no trips to the doctor. I'm talking I was healed, saved, changed, born of spirit. We jumped all in to serve God. That's where I was trained. That's where I was ordained. I was at my home church. There was the associate pastor there. We were there for 13 years. We left October 21st, 2020. We left because God told me to move to Winfield, Kansas and start Faith Ignited Church. Amen. Listen to me. We had no church behind us. We had no denominational background. We had nothing. People said, where are you going to go? I said, we're going to start preaching in our house. Guess what we did? Started preaching in my house. We were in my house five weeks and we grew. God told me to rent from this place. We came and started renting from here. Little did I know from when October 25th, when this church started in my house, that six months later, our church would be signing paperwork on this building. That was a little over two years ago and God's done great things and he'll finish what he started. Amen. Amen. If you're able, please stand with me as we honor the reading of the Word of God. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 1. Father, please bind any hindrance, God. I present myself to you, God. I'm a nothing, I'm a nobody, God. You saved me and pulled me from the darkness, God. I present myself to you in weakness. Please carry me. Please hold me. Your Word says that you chose the foolish things of this world to dumbfound the wise. Your Word teaches that you pick people that nobody else would pick. You pick the cast out the foolish. You pick the not good enough so that you'll be exalted, so that you'll be lifted up, so people will put their trust and their praise and, and put their faith in you and you only. Please anoint me, God. I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. God, without you, I can't think straight. I can't do anything, God. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Please anoint me. Let your word go forth. Have your way. In Jesus' name, everybody said. In Exodus, God led the people of children, the children of Israel. In Exodus, God saved them. He parted the Red Sea. He healed. He delivered. He set them free from their captives. That in large part is a picture of us being saved and born again. Is there anybody in the house of God that's been saved and born again? He's parted the Red Sea and now He was taking them to the Promised Land. Do you know why it was called the Promised Land? You done heard that before now. Because it was the land that was promised. And in Numbers 13, they're on the doorstep. God's already saved them. He already parted the Red Sea. Now he's going to give them the promised land. Numbers 13, verse 1, they're on the doorstep of the promised land. I've preached this principle many times. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, these things were written for our instruction, for our learning. This is for us this morning. I believe God wants to heal people, save people, and deliver people. I believe that God wants to speak and deliver people from lies and from walking around in circles. Is it hot in here? Is it just me? Somebody turn the AC down. I'll tell you what, it ain't going to be hot in heaven. I'll tell you that much. Numbers chapter 13, they're on the doorstep to the promised land. And Numbers 13, verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who were heads of the people of Israel. And verse 4 says, And these were their names. You can skip to verse 17 because they're 12 long Jewish ancient names. Amen? Amen? All right, good. Verse 17. Moses sent them out to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up into the Negev, into the hill country, and see what the land is, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds. 
And whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are trees in it or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was of the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rahab near Libo Hamath. They went up into the Negev and came to Hebron. Ahaman, Sheshai, Talmai, and the descendants of Anak were there. Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. The descendants of Anak were giants. And they came into the valley of Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes. And they carried it on a pole between two of them. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs, the place that was called the valley of Eshkol, because of the cluster that the people of Israel cut down there. And at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron, to all the congregation of the people in Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And besides this, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Those are giants. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with them said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone out to spy it out, it is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in our great height, and we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who were from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. You may be seated. They sent out 12 spies into the land. 10 came back, leaders, chiefs. 10 came back and said, hey, guess what? It's exactly what God said. There's the promised land. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's flowing. It's great. It's awesome. But the enemies are there. The enemies are there and we can't take it. And Caleb here, and later we'll see Joshua. Joshua and Caleb said we can take the promised land. God said we can take it. We can take it. This is a picture of so many today of those of you who are saved and born again and walking in circles. I want you to see something here. They're on the doorstep. They've been saved. God's part of the Red Sea. They're on the doorstep of the promised land. They're about to go and do what God's told them to do and take it. And 10 spies, 10 of the leaders says, we can't do it. Later in the end of 14, we're going to see this. They went, and this, the generation that didn't believe God is about to walk in circles for 40 years, complaining, groaning, whining. This is like so many people who are saved and born again today. They know that God has part of the Red Sea. They know that God has been good, but they walk in circles like children in a barren wilderness, lost, broken, hurt in the darkness. They, they, log, they, they walk in circles and they don't have victory. This is a trap I've seen from the devil. One of the things the enemy does to us, he gets us as Christians to focus on ourselves. He gets us to look into this mirror and pick ourselves apart. It's a snare from the devil. You know, one of the things they said here, you want to know how they looked at themselves? We seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. Some of you, God wants to take you into the promised land. Some of you, God wants to take you and it's time to cross over to the Jordan. It's time to cross over and take the promised land. Everybody listen to me. I believe the promised land is here on this side of heaven. I believe the promised land is a place that Lee can live and walk in victory. Why? Because the promised land was full of giants. It was full of enemies. 
If you read the book of Joshua, Joshua and the Caleb, uh, the son of Nun, in the book of Joshua, they take the land and they live and walk in victory because they had faith in God. This trap from the devil to focus and look at ourselves, to look at what we're not, it is such a trap of the enemy. I have fallen into it so many times and I've seen God's people fall into it so many times. The Bible says in Hebrews, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If you're saved and born again, how many of you know that we're called to look unto Jesus? Then why do so many times, spiritually speaking, we look at ourselves in a spiritual mirror and try and tell God and figure out what we need to fix and what we're doing wrong and that this isn't going to change and we're not going to walk in victory. We're not going to take hold of the promised land until we change these things about ourselves. It's not a matter of trying. God doesn't want you to try harder. It is God's will that you live and walk in victory. And I'm telling you, there's so many people that walk in circles, that walk in the wilderness, that don't have victory because they're like this. They see the things in front of them and they say, they say we're like grasshoppers. You know what they said about the coming generation? Look at Numbers 14 and verse 3. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? If there's one thing I'm tired of hearing from the church culture, I'm tired of hearing of how afraid we are. I'm tired of hearing of how bad things are and how bad things are going. I'm tired of hearing the gen- I'm tired of hearing people say, oh, our kids aren't going to make it." I'm tired of hearing people say, "What are our kids are going to do?" I'm, I'm tired of, of people saying they're not going to make it." Something that's been on my heart recently. I've been studying the psalm, the psalm of ascents. Look in Psalm 127 with me quickly. I want you to look at Psalm 127 with me quickly. You know, they had said that their kids are going to become prey. And later on in verse 14, verse 31, uh, I'm about to be back to Psalms, but God said, but your little ones who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you've rejected. I know we got our kids and children's church here this morning. Listen. Listen. Braylon, listen to me. They said, our kids aren't going to make it. They said, our kids are going to be devoured by the world. Anthony, Lacey, they said, our teens aren't going to make it. They're going to be devoured by the darkness. They're saying our kids are facing things they've never faced before. They've got things that we've never dealt with before. The teens, what are the things they're doing? At youth camp, I said, you guys say you can't read. They don't get into the Word. Kids, teenagers, you can read. You meditate on this day and night. And we wonder why our teens all day and night are meditating on this and we can't figure out why they're full of anxiety and fear and depression and worry. We've got to teach them and show them and stop telling everybody and stop telling them you're not going to make it. You're going to become prey. We've got to start showing them how to fight. We've got to start showing them how to pray. We've got to start showing them how to have victory. I've been teaching my son. He's 11, almost 12. At 12, the Jewish boys were shaved and called a man. Boy, we got 30-year-olds who are not even young men. They're old boys. That was me before I got saved. We got a bunch of old boys walking around. Where's the men? Where's the manly men to serve God? Men are being attacked. Braylon, You're a man. You understand that? You're a boy. I'm going to do my best to teach you to become a man. 
And I don't care what this world tells you. You can stand for God. And the scripture tells us to act like men. You know what? The Bible never teaches us ever to be chauvinistic pigs or jerks. They don't exist anywhere. You can be man enough to serve God. You can be man enough to get on your knees and humble yourself. You can be man enough to come and pray. You can be man enough to lay before God. You can be man enough to put up your hands as God's word has told us. You can be man enough to shout and dance before the Lord. King David slayed the lion, the bear, and the giant, and he was manly, and he danced before God with all of his might. It takes a real man to praise him. Josh, I know you're just graduating. You can be a man. We love you. We're going to keep telling you the truth and pointing you. Don't feel guilty or bad that you're a man. God gave you these biceps, amen? Amen. (laughs) Ain't nothing wrong with that. I don't care where the world accuses you. I don't care how popular it becomes. I'm not a woman. I'm not going to dress effeminate. I ain't putting on girls' jeans. I'm going to be a man. I'm going to dress like a man. I'm going to act like a man. I'm going to act like a man and serve my wife. I'm going to act like a man and love my kids and point them to Jesus. I'm going to be so manly that when I blow it and I mess up, I'm going to tell God sorry and I'm going to tell them sorry. I'm going to be so manly that I can humble myself before God and serve him. I'm going to be so manly I don't have to get drunk. I'm going to be so manly. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to be faithful to the house of God. I'm going to be here Sunday. I'm going to be here Wednesday. I'm going to be a legacy. Don't nobody have to pat me on the back and beg me to come to the house of God. I love him. He's not just my father and my friend. He's my king and my Lord. Church ought to be the reason you miss everything else. We've lost faithfulness. Where's Mitch at? Is Mitch here? He's a nurse. He's working this morning with Steve. Where's Jaden? Dad said no more traveling baseball, didn't he? Mitch is recently saved. A couple years ago, God's moved his life. Jaden, you're here this morning, aren't you? Dad said no more traveling baseball. Guess why? Because baseball's on Sundays. What this generation allows, the next generation will teach. Braylon, you need to be faithful to the house of God. Someday, when you get married, you're going to have a wife and kids. And you know what? You're going to have your own family. I'm tired of people saying the generations won't make it. It's just like what we read. They said they won't make it. And you know what God said? The children that you said would become prey. I'm paraphrasing from Numbers 14. He said, they're the ones that are gonna go live and walk in victory. Everybody look at me. You can live and walk in victory today. And that's what I'm trying to preach. I may not be doing a good job this morning. I honestly may not be, but I do know this, that God's word is going forth and he's gonna finish what he started. And Anthony, let me tell you something. When you don't feel like you're doing a good job, let me tell you something as a preacher. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith, not feelings. Sometimes our feelings don't line up to what's going on. But guess what? You keep preaching the word in season and out of season. You be faithful because I promise you he is faithful. And he will finish what he started. See, what I'm trying to tell you this morning is this. Steve, the children of Israel had a past tense faith, a future tense faith. But they were going to walk in circles for 40 years. They said we can't take the promised land because they didn't have a present tense faith that said today. Somebody say today. He's on his throne today. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. And if he said you can take it, you can take it. If he said you can live and walk in victory, you can. If he said you can raise your families and serve God, you can. As Christians, I'm telling you, people walk in circles and don't have a present tense faith. It's a trap from the devil. We're looking at ourselves in the mirror. We're like grasshoppers. That's what they're saying. Looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, I'm not good enough. If you don't feel good enough, are you willing to raise your hand? Hold on. That's what I'm talking about. I'm going to give you another chance. If you don't feel good enough, go ahead and raise your hand. 
Hey, I got good news, everybody. I got good news. Guess what? God picks the people that we wouldn't pick. They said we're like grasshoppers. That's because they were looking at themselves. If you don't feel good enough, I have good news for you. Don't look at yourself. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. When David defeated the giant, Braylon, he didn't look at himself. He said, my God is so much bigger than that giant. Listen, Braylon, I've been thinking about you this week. Where's Lawson? Boy, he's sleeping. All right. I'm going to give him a slide on this one. He's seven. All right. Verse Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, please turn the prayer music on. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. Everybody listen here, somebody in this room needs to hear this. For he gives his beloved sleep. Some of you in here need sleep. I'm gonna say that again. Some of you in here need sleep. You know, so often we think that things aren't spiritual. Look at me. Oh, it's spiritual. And sometimes you need to stop and say this, it is spiritual. Go ahead and say it. Say, it is spiritual. Now two words, I'll shorten it up. Say, it's spiritual. Say, it's spirit. You've been taking all that stuff, you've been doing whatever you can and you can't get sleep. For he gives to his beloved sleep. sleep, peace, you're going to have to obey God and do things His way. I'm thankful that you've been mowing Roger's yard across the street. You need to keep working. You know what I see? A bunch of old boys running around this town and they ain't working. That ain't right. Braylon, I'm a full-time pastor. I still got my Kemper renewal check that I worked my butt off for for them six years. I got my monthly renewal check still. And I worked at Gaston's floor covering all this week. I got three sources of income. Let me tell you something, work. Work your butt off, work. If you want to be a man and raise your family, work hard, work. Why are you saying that? Some people don't sleep because they're not even doing what God's called them to do. Men, teenage boys, listen to me, work. You want God's sleep? You want rest? Do what he's called you to do. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. Praise God for them babies, amen? I was about to hold up their baby up here and go all Rafiki on that thing. <laughs> Listen, I'll talk to you families. We've got four kids, maybe God will give us more. I know in 2023, that's just like so weird to everybody. Yeah, it's from the devilish culture telling us not to be good moms and dads, telling us that we're not even male and female anymore. And this devilish culture that is so full of fear and anxiety and depression and worry, they're telling us what we should do and they have no answer for any of the problems. Look at me, I've got the answer, I've got the prescription and I've got the order and his name's Jesus Christ. And we can follow his word and we can live and walk in victory. Yeah, people used to have kids, 10, 20 kids. Now if you've got more than three, you're a weirdo. Well, I don't care, I'm a weirdo, I don't care. I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna serve God. Some of you thought it was so weird that we were praising and singing this morning. I don't care. When I got saved, I thought it was weird too. I don't care. I just don't care anymore. Oh, somebody already should have been running laps in here already. 
We don't think it's weird when we go to the Chiefs game. We don't think it's weird when we go to a concert. We don't think any of that praise is weird. We don't think it's weird when uh, a baby's shouting because they're supposed to. We don't think it's weird when kids are jumping up and down at VBS. We don't think it's weird. And then we come in here. Let me tell you why you think it's weird. Because your flesh doesn't like it when you praise God. You're allowed to. Your flesh will allow you to praise and sing and shout for everything else other than in God's house. My goodness, Braylon, we need more men to put their hands in the air. You know why it's tough, Braylon? Because it hurts something that us men have that we struggle with. Pride. Don't be afraid. Stand up. So many times the Spirit of God is telling me to move, to shout, and my pride is saying, my pride and the accusations of my flesh and the lies of the devil are saying, don't draw attention to yourself. Don't praise and serve the Lord. Don't do it. But I've got to get to a place where I say this on the inside. I don't care what anybody thinks in here. The music and the songs are not to please anybody in here. And I don't care if they like it or not. I don't care if they like the girls doing banners. That's scriptural. I don't care if they don't like shouting. I don't care if they don't like raising hands. We're not here to please people. Our job is to serve and praise the Lord and exalt Jesus. And the word says, he told Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. It's his, he'll build it, he'll grow it. We've got to exalt Jesus. And Jesus said, if I am lifted up, we'll draw all men to myself. He'll save, he'll change, he'll grow his church. And we can look at the word and do it his way. And you can be a man and you can put up these arms both towards heaven and you can praise and worship God. And I want you to get to a place, I want you to grow to a place where you don't care what anybody in this place says. You're going to middle school next year. I want you to get to a place where you're so manly, you don't care about what anybody thinks because you're my son, because you're his son, because you're born again because we're manly enough to serve God. We're manly enough to serve Him. We're manly enough to humble ourselves. We're manly enough to say sorry when we blow it. You understand me, son? Amen. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like, er that's not what the world says like arrows in the hand of a warrior. I'm a warrior. And he's like an arrow in my hand. How do you know that, Branson? Because God just stinking said so, that's how. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Isn't that funny? Isn't that, isn't that what the world does? Sh sh say shame. I, I won't be put to shame when I face my enemies. This is a spiritual battle. Why? Because my children, Hattie, my children, you're my daughter. You, according to God's word, are like arrows in the hand of a warrior. I'm going to do my best to aim you to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world. I'm going to pull back. I'm going to let them arrows fly and go serve Jesus Christ. And you know what? I don't care what the generation says. They say, well, you're not going to make it. You're going to become his prey. You know what God says about you? The generation that you said would become prey. Brooke, he says, that generation is going to go and take the promised land. It's time for your generation to rise up and go take the promised land. You can stand and live and walk in victory. I don't care how dark the days are getting. Jesus is brighter and he'll shine and he'll move. Amen. Don't feel obligated to clap. I'm going to sweat, spill and scream no matter what. So don't worry about it. You guys think I'm wild. You should have seen John the Baptist. I told somebody the other day, Anthony, it'd just be better if you just didn't think of me as a pastor. It'd just be better to people. If you just think of a wild man wearing that furry hair and the leather belt, if you just think of a wild man preaching his heart out, that, that'd just be, it might help you out a little bit. our text. Please stand with me if you're able to all over this room. 
Numbers 14, 31, but this is God speaking, but your little ones who you said would become prey, I will bring in and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness. They're gonna what? Your kids are gonna suffer because of your faithlessness. Jaden, I know that your dad's a, a nurse and I know that he's faithful and I know at times he works on Sundays, not very often, but I know he's lived and faithful. And I know that you're here at church this morning because your dad turned off traveling baseball. I promise you in the realm of eternity, being here matters much more. When I was growing up, which wasn't that long ago, I'm only 41, they didn't put sports on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Next week, they got football, Winfield football and cheer. I love it, great program down here. Last year, we beat Derby. Pow, I love saying that, sorry. Sorry about that. Oh man, I wanna say it again, honey. We beat Derby, I'm done. Next year, they got football camp, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're gonna pay for it, Braylon's gonna go. He's not going Wednesday night. You know why? Guess where he's gonna be Wednesday night? Why? <laughs> I'll tell you why. For 40 years they shall suffer for your faithlessness. Oh, we don't have to be faithful anymore. It's all spiritual. Where are you getting that from? Show me. Where are you getting that from? It's a lie from the pits of hell. As, look, everybody look at me. <laughs> Choose you this dame who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know what, Braylon, the days are growing darker. And I don't know what's gonna happen. I can tell you this, you look at me, son. You serve God, we will make it to the other side. I don't know what's gonna happen. I could spend the rest of my life in prison. I could be martyred or killed. You need to know this, the Bible teaches that our glory, our home is not here. We're pilgrims passing through. And you need to know this, if something bad ever happens to me for living for God, you need to know this, death is not the end. Jesus has defeated death, hell, and the grave. He is the judge, and when I get to the other side, let me tell you something, you serve God's son, I'll see you on the other side. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior. World, you better watch out. I got another son named Lawson. You better watch out. You better watch out. Hattie, Della, my daughters, I want you to be like Queen Esther. The world says in this dark feminist lies that's from the pits of hell, that if you submit to God, that you're lower. That's a devilish lie. We're equals in Jesus' name. Jesus was equal to God and he submitted to the will of the Father. So if you say that submitting to a godly authority is unequal, that's blasphemy because Jesus was equal with God. To say otherwise is blasphemy. And he submitted to the will of the Father. You read the book of Esther, she humbles herself more and more. You know who she listens to? Her uncle who basically raised her, her dad, Mordecai. She listened to him. And guess what? She humbled herself lower and lower. And guess what? When she humbled herself, as you read the book, she's standing there 10 feet tall because God exalts those who humble themselves and he opposes the proud. I want you to be a woman of God. I want you to be an Esther. I don't want you boy chasing. I want you to find your rest in the man, Jesus. And I want you to put Jesus above everything. Because me and your mom, we're best friends. We have a great marriage. And there's somebody I put more important than your mom and that I love more. It's Jesus. And mom puts Jesus over me. And that's why we have such a great marriage. That's why you get to see us have a great relationship. That's the secret. It's Jesus.
I'll read this and I'll close. Matt Stevenson, you know this was supposed to be a short sermon today. All right, did you believe any of that? Just forget it. <laughs> Numbers 14, 39, when Moses told these words to the people, I skipped a lot, but the next generation, they're gonna take the promised land. They're gonna go into the book of Joshua and the people who had faith, they're gonna take the land. Those are gonna walk in circles and Moses prayed to God that he would forgive him and God said that they'd be forgiven, but they're gonna walk and wander in circles for 40 years. Re listen to what happened at the end, verse 39. When Moses told these words to all the people of Israel, the people mourned greatly and they rose early in the morning and went up to the heights of the hill country saying, here we are, we will go up to the place that God has promised for we have sinned. Let me tell you what's going on. They heard God's judgment and they heard what he said, that they're not gonna go to the promised land. And they said, no, 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 we're sorry. We don't want to deal with the consequences. We're sorry. We'll go and we'll go into the promised land. Here we are to fight. Darren, in my life, so many times I went to the altars and I asked God to save me and I said the right words and I left wandering in darkness. I was saying the right words, but here's what I was really saying, Darren. I was saying, God, deliver me from all my bad consequences that I've sown. You reap what you sow. God, deliver me from all my consequences. Deliver me from all this bad stuff. God, here, take all this and fix it all. You can have everything, but you can't have me. Some of you in here, listen to me. You need to ask God to save you and forgive you. You're hanging on to that little bit. That little bit is everything that he wants. <laughs> there they said, we're sorry. Wait, wait, we'll go. Verse 41, Moses said, why are you transgressing against the command of the Lord when it will not succeed? They're saying, we'll go fight. We're gonna go take the land. Moses said, don't, you'll die. Do not go up for the Lord is not among you, lest you be struck down before your enemies. For there the Amalekites and the Canaanites are facing you and you shall fall by the sword because you've turned back from following the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the heights of the hill country, although neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, nor Moses departed out of the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and defeated them and pursued them even to Hormah. Listen. They said, oh, 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 we got this. The Ark of the Covenant at that time in the Old Testament, that was literally the presence of God. They didn't have the presence of God and Moses didn't go. They said, oh, oh, we'll go take it anyway. So they went and got slaughtered. What's this is a picture of? Listen to me. Brady, I've seen this in 15 years of serving God. I've seen it in ministry. People who think they're gonna go do their own thing. Oh, I've got this, even though that the Ark of the Covenant's not there and Moses isn't there. I'm gonna just go, I'll go ahead and go do this. Braylon, Hattie, Lawson, Della, church. If you wanna have victory and good success, it's so wild for me to say this because I was the most arrogant, rebellious, hating authority person I've ever met in my entire life. And God has broken me, saved me. And Steve, I'm gonna tell you something. God's grind me to powder as a Christian, as an ordained powder many times. And God has told me this, Steve. Branson, I don't need you for anything. I've learned, Steve, I always have the option. We can humble ourselves and die into self. What are you saying, Branson? They didn't follow God's order in his way. There is a God-given order and prescription for victory and for success. You better follow the presence of God. I'm gonna to read to you something that the American culture is about to get really angry. I can't believe I'm closing on this. I thought I was gonna close on a really good positive note. The Lord told me to read this. Here's something that bothers our American culture and bothers the American church. And Braylon, it bothered me. God came down and grind me to powder. And I'm gonna teach you something, 
Some people, Braylon in here, are gonna get this principle. They're gonna live and walk in victory. Some people are gonna get mad and rage in their hearts against the Lord, and they're gonna tell you everything that it doesn't mean, other than look at what it does say. Because people hate submission, and in our American culture of arrogance and pride, we basically say, nobody tells me what to do. Braylon, if you wanna live for God, let me tell you something. Hebrews 13, 17. Listen to me, son. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. Braylon, I can sense my flesh right now wanting to explain and wanting to tell everybody what it doesn't say and what I don't mean. I'm not going to. I'm gonna read God's word. And if people have a problem with it, they're gonna to have to go ask God and be mad at him rather than your dad. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. One more verse and I'm done. First Thessalonians 5.12. Now remember this with the last verses that I just read. Remember this with the sermon that I just preached. Remember this with the people that chose to not go with the presence of God, that chose to not do what Moses warned them to do. And they said, we don't need what Moses says. We don't know, we don't need the Ark of the Covenant. We don't need what God says through his servant Moses. We don't have to follow him. We'll just go do it on our own. Remember they got slaughtered and died. Remember that part when I'm reading this. 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. We ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord, admonish you, to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves and we urge you brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good. You test every word that I preach. You test everything in here. My job is to preach the word in season and out of season. I'm commanded to preach the word. Not my thoughts, not my opinion, not my denomination. I will preach the word. Do not despise prophecies. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Father, please finish what you started. God, I'm so thankful that you're alive. I'm thankful that your spirit is here with us. God, please save souls and move in this place. God, the service isn't really kind of what I planned, but I know that your spirit has led and I know that you're here speaking. God, I pray in Jesus' name, I'm asking you right now, Father, in Jesus' name, fill this place with your spirit. Please finish what you've started. Please save souls. Your word says, do not quench the spirit. This is your spirit's leading. Please save souls. Please deliver families and homes. Please don't let us fall into the trap as Christians that, well, I know that you were good back then, you saved me. I know that you're gonna be good when we get home someday. But let us not be this, like this generation that fell into that trap of looking at ourselves and we don't have victory today. We're wandering in circles. Help us today to get our eyes off of ourself and to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I pray for our church, our families, our homes, as we pray right now in Jesus' name. Is there anybody in this place as we're still praying? Is there anyone in this room that doesn't know that they're saved and born again. I'm not gonna call you out, I'm not gonna embarrass you. If you don't know that you're saved and today you wanna be saved, I want you to open your eyes and look at me and raise your hand if that's you. 
all over this room. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. Thank you for looking me in the eye. It takes a real man to do that in a moment like this. Anybody else? Everybody's still praying. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. I see this hand. If you want to get saved and today's your day, I see that hand. If you want to get saved and be born again today, you want sleep, you want rest. I thank God for those things. The most thing that you need more than anything is forgiveness. You can put your hands down. How many of you in this room while we're praying, how many of you in this room, you know that you're saved and born again? And you say, Branson, I'm tired of walking in circles. I wanna cross over to the Jordan. I wanna follow the captain of salvation. I'm gonna live and walk in victory. Today's my day. Today, today God's gonna restore and revive. Today I'm gonna stop looking at myself. I'm gonna stop picking myself apart. I'm gonna stop telling God how weak I am and what I'm not. Today I'm gonna look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If that's you, would you raise your hand? that you raise your hand. You can put your hands down. Church, go ahead and look at me. Matt, you can turn that up, brother, a little bit. Uh, uh, Matt, what we'll do is we're gonna have some time and I'm gonna leave this music on. We're gonna have a time of altar and then whenever you guys feel led, you can come up here. We'll have a little intermission, let people get a drink, go to the bathroom before we do the altar call. But here's what we're gonna do right now. I wanna ask everybody right now, unless it's in a total emergency, if it's not an emergency, I wanna ask everybody, don't walk out and don't leave right now. You'll have a chance in a moment, I promise. I know it's long, it's 12.09. Listen, I planned on preaching a short sermon, but God's told me don't quench the spirit. Everybody listen, listen. We're gonna have a time of prayer. I believe in with all my heart. I could preach a whole sermon to you about it. I'm not going to, don't worry. I believe in responding to God when He is speaking. I believe in responding to God when He's moving. There was, I think there was about eight, ten hands that raised their hand for salvation. Amen. And there was an amen. There's a lot of other hands from the church. Here's what I want to do. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Listen, I know this, it's spiritual. I know the enemy wants to come in right now and put cinder blocks on our arms, on our legs. He don't want none of us to move. Listen to me, you have freedom. I don't care if you're a Christian and you're brand new here today, you can walk around and pray. I want people, uh, listen, if, and I'm not asking you to respond to me. If you don't wanna come forward, then don't come forward, seriously. But those of you that need to be saved, I want you to step out and come and cry out to God. Those of you, the families that said, I want deliverance today, I wanna to walk in victory. If you have any need today, we're all going to pray together. Would you, hey, no, uh, uh, Danielle, pull up that, that, remember that first verse I had? It's written, my house should be called the house of prayer, Matthew 21, uh, maybe 14, the first one. Guys, this is a time to pray. So we're gonna pray, we're gonna have an altar call. So you guys, come on forward, let's go, go ahead. Matt, would you turn that up a little bit, brother? Thank you.